Hi, I'm Dr. Lila Proenza. And I'm Dr. Miranda Siddhar. And, and this, this is How We Think Ahead. And today we're going to be talking to you about everything histopomorphs, everything with our guinea pigs and our chinchillas. From getting comfortable with the basics to doing anesthesia and basic surgical procedures. Intubation, mm -hmm. dental procedures, space, neuters, urinary diseases, respiratory diseases, the sneaky unrecognized killers like cardiovascular disease. For sure, ER, we're going to talk about CPR. We're also going to talk about imaging and blood work interpretation, as well as husbandry techniques, because that's always important in our small mammal species. If you are a veterinary professional, either a veterinarian or a technician or a student, this course is certainly for you. For more information, visit vetahead.vet. Tommy, are we live? Hello, Vera Harris. Are you there? Say hi to me. Kami says yes. Let me go live on Instagram too. Hello, Vera Hatters. How many people do we have? Like, hello, Vera Hatters here on Instagram. This is Dr. Proenza. Good morning. I'm speaking directly from Brazil. We are here on our free webinar. We're going to be talking about rabbit anesthesia. We're going to be talking about how to stop losing rabbit patients. Hello, everybody here on our webinar, free webinar here on Instagram. If you are here on Instagram, we are live on our webinar. You can definitely go there to watch us. I'm only going to run here the live on the first 10 minutes of this webinar. We're going to be talking about how to stop losing rabbits during anesthesia. We're going to be talking about how to be less reliant on anesthesia, on gas anesthesia, right? Because gas anesthesia inadvertently will make our patients be hypotensive, will make our patients be hy hypoventilate, and we will end up losing them. So what can we do to not use as much or not use at all gas anesthesia and have a very safe, very smooth sailing anesthesia for hours and hours and hours? My rabbit dentals last four hours, sometimes five hours. It depends on how many teeth I need to extract. Hello, Livia. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. So if you're here on the Instagram Live and you want to watch this webinar, which is free, you need to go to the link. And Sarah, hello from Seattle. Guys, tell me here on Instagram and here on the webinar where you are talking from. I think we have a little bit of a delay because I'm in Brazil, so we need to cross the ocean. But that was a dead joke. But um, I will definitely be able to answer all your questions here on the webinar. So if you're here on Instagram, come here. Tell people here on the Instagram comments where they can go to join our webinar i think it might be even a link somewhere but she will come here okay grandma of the gram i'm the grandma of the gram so i'm not even i'm not exactly sure she will come back here but we're gonna be talking about how to not stop losing patients do you guys i want to know where you're talking from here on instagram where are you from heli from terra chile south dakota Oh my God. Oh, and Elida put a little Brazilian flag. Another person from Chile is Spain, Turkey. Oh my, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia. Oh my God. This is amazing, guys. Oh, and it shows with your little picture. That's awesome. Minnesota. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Vargas Godoy. How are you doing? Oh my God. Guys, here on Instagram, we're going to be running just for. A little bit for the like maybe 10 minutes or so and then if you want to oh, another one from uh, uh, saudi arabia oh my god are we famous in saudi arabia minnesota another minnesota here puerto rico livia larca on brasilia what are you doing that you're not here livia uh usa uh new york in the united states you know what people from new york will understand me probably i was promised winter here in brazil okay and it's so cold that I only brought like two outfits that were not for winter. And now I need to like wash them every two days. 
and also <laughs> Puerto Rico. Oh my God, this is amazing. So we're going to be talking about not to lose, um, not to lose rabbits during anesthesia. Um, there are many techniques that we can use. And guess what? These techniques are going to be great for your dog and cat patients as well. Elida says, yes, I'm from Brazil like you, just another state, Rio Grande do Sul. Oh, tirar os cuchar do bolso. Wow, isn't that a saying you say? Um, okay, guys, that's so, so awesome. We are here all there. You can, you can ask, if you're here on the webinar, you can ask questions during this uh, presentation. Um, and we will serve as many as we can, if not all of them, okay? So let's start here. Kami, Kami joined too on the Instagram. She's going to put the link for you guys there because as I told you, I'm only going to run the live here on Instagram the first 10 minutes of this presentation. And then we are going to just go to the webinar. It's a free webinar. Guys, can you do me a favor, everybody? Can you send this link? to everybody you know that can use this presentation, okay? Veterinarians, technicians, uh, vet assistants, anyone that you know that could benefit, because this live, guys, is not gonna be recorded, okay? This live is not gonna be recorded, so it's now or never. And uh, Camille is saying to tap the link in the bio so you can join the webinar for free. So if you're on Instagram, tap the link in the bio. If you were on the webinar, you can share the link you received, or you can also tell them to go to our bio on Instagram and join as well. Uh, we're trying to do these webinars every month. Uh, if you guys have a topic that you want me to talk on, leave here on the comments too on the webinar or the Instagram comments, uh, and then we will try to address them. Um, so anyway, guys, thank you so much. Kami, Kami, is, she, Kami has the, the rings today. She can pass the slides for me. So I'll be queuing her on the slides. I have here my coffee. It's 10 a.m. in the morning here. I am in Brazil this week. I'm coming back to the U.S. on Saturday. Um, I just woke up. You might hear my grandparents in the background, but that's real life. And I love them so much. By the way, talking about grandparents, got this. I was like, okay, grandma, I'm going to be presenting these on a live. She, she's not very sure what live is, right? It's like, I'm going to be lecturing to my friends. And she goes like, you're not going to do any makeup. I'm like, I have makeup on, grandma. And she was like, oh. <laughs> Grandmas are very, very honest, right? I am lucky because she does not understand English. Otherwise, she will be very mad at me right now. Uh, so, guys, I am Dr. Lila Provenza. I'm the CEO and founder of Vet Ahead. It's a, Vet Ahead is an online training program. The reason I say training program is because it's not just like a lecture like this one, right? A lecture like this one is great. I'm going to teach you some tips, but you're not going to be able to go back and implement from start to zero, right? Because if you don't even know how to examine a rabbit, how are you going to do it, right? Or if you don't know how to collect blood, place a catheter or intubate. So our courses, our online training program or our courses, they teach you from start to end. So you go from how to restrain a rabbit, what they eat, um, how to talk to, ouch, <laughs> I know, right, then. <laughs> I know, uh, and we teach you everything, so, so, and we have in many species, right, we have our emergency course, for example, it has everything on all species, so birds, reptiles, small mammals, so you, you learn it all, we just launched our historical morph uh, medicine and surgery course, which is guinea pigs and chinchillas with the queen, Dr. Sadar, and myself, we teach uh, um, historical morph medicine and surgery. We have the rabbit medicine surgery. We have the emergency course. We have now coming in the fall, uh, the backyard chicken, pet chickens. I cannot wait. That one is so amazing. We have four instructors for that one. It's so cool. Uh, so join the movement. So we have our membership, which is called Essentials Membership, which you can have access to all our courses, all of them. You don't need to choose. You pay one fee, have access to all. We have all the ebooks, okay, that has the illustrations, pictures. We have so many pictures and videos, so many. Um, and you have our emergency calculator. Calculators. So I'm going to be talking today about emergency calculators, which is you put the, in this case, the rabbit, you go there, you open our emergency calculator, you put the weight of the rabbit and it calculates for you all the emergency drugs. All you have to do is print. Can't, can't get easier than that. Uh, we also have a monthly newsletter or 
We also have not or and and because those complement each other. We have the Vetahead community. For example, in our Vetahead community, you do not have access to our courses, okay? But you do have access to me. For instance, we have many video calls like this just for the community where I teach a topic they want to learn about. I answer questions about cases. I, we have journal clubs that bring this, the papers, the recent studies. They're very interesting. They are very applicable in our practice. We talk about them. Um, also, for example, this live does stay in the community for two weeks. That's the only place this live is going to live is in the community. So our members of the community, they can definitely um, have access to these webinars. Um, and we have networking, we can talk to each other, open chat recommendations, etc. So guys, those two things, Camila, you can pass that for us. And uh, um, that's all we can learn in both. So I would say perfectly case scenario, you have both products, okay? And you do get a discount, okay? A discount if you are a member, a essential member, um, in, uh, sorry, if you are in the community and you want to become an essential member, you get a discount. OK, uh, so today we're going to be talking about how to stop losing rabbit patients during anesthesia. My friends on Instagram, I want to see you there. So click the link in the bio, like Camila said, go to the free web, please take a friend with you. OK, send the link with a friend. I'll see you soon, hopefully on the webinar. Hello, Gabby and Friends from webinar, I to you now. Um, okay. So, guys, do you anesthetize, do you anesthetize an, a lot of rabbits in your practice or are you still very afraid to do so? I want to know. Because it can be a little frightening, right? Um, and especially if we don't know exactly what to do. Oh, my God. I'm sorry, guys. Let me ask them to close the door. Vó. Você pode fechar a porta da cozinha, por favor, vó? Pode fechar a porta da cozinha, por favor? Você pode fechar a porta da cozinha, por favor? Obrigada. My grandma asking her to close the door. Um, okay, guys. So uh, next slide, please. Come is posting all the links here for you. Please feel free to ask questions. So this is how an decision on a rabbit should be run, okay? Um, and I know it might be some overwhelming for some of you or from some others of you, it looks like, just like a dog and cat anesthesia, right? So we have the patient position right there, in this case, the rabbit, but then he's, the rabbit's connected to uh, Fuzzy Bunny. I made it, perfect timing for my, because 9 p.m. in the Philippines. Hello from the Philippines. Welcome, Fuzzy Bunny. Uh, so here you see, we have a monitoring, and I think that's so, so important. I see a monitor there, so I can see those blue waves. I, I know those are capnographs, so my rabbit is intubated. OK, that is very important. We're not going to be covering intubation on this webinar. We talked about this on the previous webinar. Um, we also have this in all our courses online, our training courses. So you if you want to learn intubation, you go there. And if you were on the last time on the previous webinar, you did learn how to intubate rabbits with me. Guys, there's no skipping. OK, um, we have to intubate because if we don't intubate, we're not going to be able to ventilate our patients. And more importantly, uh, or equally as important, we're not going to be able to monitor the entire CO2. And that entire CO2 is going to tell us everything or how stable the anesthesia is. Because here's the thing, guys, and we're going to be talking about monitoring today. With inhalant anesthesia, no, it doesn't matter which gas you're using, isofluorine, sevoflurane, it doesn't matter, okay? They will, it's not if, they will cause hypotension. So they will lower the blood pressure. That's not a if, it's a when. That's why sometimes when we hear, when we're anesthetizing rabbits, we hear people saying things like, oh, when it hits the 40 minute mark or the one hour mark, that's when I lose my patience. That's when that's, those things start ha happening and the rabbit is no longer able to compensate, right? The rabbit is no longer able, the, the rabbit is practically saying, okay, guys, I try for 40 minutes, but you're not helping me out here. So now I'm just going to crash. And and that's because we don't provide means for that rabbit to be on homeostasis. One of them is intubation. And then you might say, oh, Dr. Prensa, but my rabbits don't stop breathing, okay? They are breathing throughout the whole procedure. I get it, that's great. That does not mean they are ventilating properly. And I can guarantee you, guarantee you, 
that I bet money that if you were monitoring the entitled CO2, and the only way to do that is intubating, you will see that entitled CO2 is very high, which means when the entitled CO2 during the surgery should be between 35 and 45 millimeter, millimeters of mercury. Okay, and, it, and I can guarantee you this number is going to be above 45. And why can I guarantee that? Because I know they will hypoventilate. Even though they're breathing, they're not ventilating properly. And why is that? We put them on their back, okay? Um, and there's all that GI that is very huge in the rabbit, right? Sitting on top of the diaphragm, sitting on top of the lung. The lung cannot expand as well. Say, ah, oh, Dr. Branson, but I do my surgery on lateral recumbency. Still, you are anesthetizing them. So you tricking the biochemistry of the brain and they will not be able to, to ventilate properly. Besides, their thorax is so small compared to their abdomen. Um, let's, let's see the next slide coming. But again, guys, bottom line is we will be learning how to mimic what we do to dogs and cats, right? It needs to be the exact same thing. But here I'm going to be giving you, you're going to see that some of the doses are way higher than for dogs and cats because rabbits that have a higher metabolism. I want to give you some background. Is this speed okay with you, for you guys? Um, I'm here drinking my coffee. Isn't this mug so cute? This mug was mine when I used to live in Brazil 15 years ago. <laughs> And I left with my grandmother. Uh, let me know if this speed is good for you guys. But I want to give you some background, okay? So I know that, and you're going to see ZCA a lot here. You're going to see, I don't see, I don't say exotic medicine, exotic animal medicine. That's a whole new webinar. But I refer to zoo med, zoological medicine, which does not mean animals in a zoo, like the, the place, the institution, okay? Uh, I'm talking about zoological companion animals. That's why the ZCA, which are the pets, okay? The exotic pets. I'm picking up what you're putting down. Hey, Diana. Diana. It's Diana, right? Oh, my God. Good speed, Sarah, Elita. Yes. Elita is the name of the person that cuts my hair. By the way, I need a new haircut. Um, anyway, so, guys, majority of our spe species will need to be either sedated or anesthetized for procedures, right? I don't do any radiographs with awake patients. I sedate everybody. Um, and not to mention anesthesia when we're doing surgeries or sometimes wound lacerations, like we need to um, correct a laceration uh, and so forth. And we know that the morbidity and mortality in rabbits, it's a little higher than dogs and cats. That is true. But one thing that I think we, we kind of overestimate is how dangerous or how high this morbidity and mortality is. The reality, guys, is that it's somewhere between 1.4% to 4.8%. So if in those studies here, where um, this percentage, this average was taken from, not necessarily people were intubating these rabbits, okay? So uh, keep in mind, those are not necessarily studies based on safe anesthesia. Those are just looking at anesthesia in general. And we know the majority of people, including myself in the past, my previous life as a veterinarian, as a big veterinarian, we would mess them down. And so for that, to have a one4 to let's say 5% anesthesia risk, that's not that high, okay? It's higher than dogs and cats. And the reason I believe it's higher than dogs and cats is because majority of people don't intubate rabbits, right? So uh, let's check the next slide. Now, the other very important thing, guys, have your procedure planned ahead of time, okay? We can't be all discombobulated, trying to calculate doses, trying to calculate CRIs once we already have the patient anesthetized. Another very important thing, you need to have a person that is dedicated to the anesthesia. It can be uh, the tech, it can be another veterinarian, but it cannot be you, for example. If you're doing the procedure, you're doing the procedure. You are not helping with anesthesia. And the person that is doing the anesthesia is not helping fetch stuff. Listen, it might get to a point where you all get so comfortable that you can do that. But right now is not that moment, right? Right now is the moment where you focus on attention is strictly on what you are doing, okay? And come, you can pass the next slide. Um, what I'm, I'm saying by that is 
That person that is anesthetizing, guys, is literally like an eagle looking and monitoring that rabbit. That person is not uh, give, give, fetching a syringe for you. That person is not, you know, trying to open the sterile equipment for you. That person is not doing that. That person is literally the sole job is to monitor the rabbit. And I, I think it's so important because a lot of times, you know, we, we only trust the equipment and we're not putting our stethoscope in the rabbit. We're not picking up the trends. It's all about the trends, guys. No animal, and you're probably going to hate me when I say this, but bear with me. Kami, that's actually a very good point, okay, that I want to make across. Like, so, so keep this point in mind to record, to show everywhere. No animal, guys, when they are anesthetized, no animal crashes out of the blue. I know you're going to hate me for that. I know you're probably thinking she's crazy. Of course they do. I've seen it multiple times, but they don't, guys. They don't. And, and I'm, I'm blaming me too, okay? I, I do the same thing, or I used to. You can definitely pick up the trends before they crash. We are not paying attention to the trends. Our slide changes on the heart rate, on the blood pressure, or the entitled CO2. So entitled CO2 that was, say, was about 40. The entire procedure then starts being 45, 50, 55. And you're like, oh, it's fine, it's fine. That's a trend. The, the blood pressure, the mean blood pressure, it was like 89. And then it starts being 80, 75, right? You're not going to wait until that pressure is below 60 millimeters per mercury to actually do something about it. Pick the trends, guys. When it goes below what, the, what they should be, that's when they crash, okay? So we need to pick up those trends. Are you with me? Do you agree with me? We are missing those trends, guys. You want me to teach you to not lose your patience, right? So we're going to hear a lot of things that we don't want to hear sometimes that make us feel bad. I know because I felt that way, okay? And I'm not saying this to judge you or to make you feel guilty. But we're going to need to deep dive on what we're doing, how we are practicing so we can improve. Got it? And we're together on this one, guys. I'm going to share so many mistakes I made. I am super. <gasps> Dr. Chin. Oh, my God. Guys, everybody send love to Dr. Chin. Not only Dr. Chin is my beautiful, amazing, intelligent friend. She is the best criticalist in the entire universe. Okay. Hello, Dr. Chin. I love her so much. Um, okay. So pre-anesthetic preparation, we need to have all of those things. Um, come here, I need to see that slide. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to have all of these things prepped, right? So you're not going to skip your, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend so much time on this because again, guys, standard of care, you need to have your history, your physical examination. You have to have pre-anesthetic blood work guys, because we can do, we cannot do magic. And honestly, if you want my advice, I would already put these charges for the blood work in the surgery, okay? Um, if you have the ability to have a surgery um, pack fee, so a lot of times we have like a group fee. It's like in, under the surgery, you have all of the other fees in there already that cannot be deleted or separate from anything. I would put your blood work there. So the owner has no way to say, oh, no, I don't want to do the blood work. You say, mm, I'm so sorry. It's already in the price of the surgery. I can't change that. Because, guys, we're not magicians, right? We're not. If you don't know what you're dealing with, how are you going to even prevent problems? How are you going to even mitigate problems? How are you going to even treat the problems? For instance, if the patient protein is low, you're going to have problems in anesthesia because the anesthetic, guess what? It binds to the protein to circulate in the blood, right? If the patient is anemic, if the patient is azotemic, so the creatinine and BUNA high, you need to know those things, right? So very minimal, what we should do is PCV, total solids, right? So you're going to have those values. And we need to do blood uh, glucose. And here, uh, we need to use the human AQ check if you are using portable glucometers. If you use bench analyzers, no problem, it's fine. Um, and we also need to have a BUN or use, use the ASO stick to have an idea of the BUN. So no excuses because those four things are very cheap. Next slide. So again, we definitely need, so you cannot use your alpha track, okay guys? Your alpha track for blood glucose is not accurate in bunnies. It needs to be the human glucometer. We also need to classify 
how risky is this surgery, is this anesthesia? So the ASA guidelines, the American Society of Anesthesia, they have the guidelines from one to five. So is a normal healthy patient that I'm spaying or is a moribund patient that it's not expected to survive this surgery, right? Level five. So we always need to grade that so we know how risky anesthesia is. Um, next slide. Sarah Kennett. Thank you, because you know what? She's asking about you fast, your rabbits, how long? Thank you, because I remember it was on that slide and I didn't talk about it. Thank you. Please keep doing this. Um, so rabbits cannot vomit. They anatomically, physiologically cannot vomit. So we don't need to um, fast them. Also, and by fasting them, you will probably cause some level of GI syndrome. Um, and even if you were to, let's say GI syndrome was not a problem, you were to, um, to fast them, to empty the stomach, right? Um, you can never empty completely the stomach of a rabbit. It's not the physiology, and that's a topic for another, another webinar. But the point is, you're not going to accomplish what you want. Now, I will fast them for at least like two hours, three hours, because, uh, I mean, minimum of one hour, but probably two hours, because what I'm trying to do with that is empty the oral cavity. And why? Because they will have a lot of hay and food in the mouth, right? Just the way they are, always chewing, chewing, chewing. And I want that mouth to be very, very empty when I go to intubate. Because if there is a lot of uh, feces, sometimes if they're eating, uh, you know, coprophagia, if there's a lot of hay, it can hinder uh, me from seeing the epiglottis. It can get on my way. Or I can even push a little hay or something inside of the trachea. I definitely don't want that. Uh, thanks for this question, Sam. That was great. So we need to also have a checklist, everything that I need to do. Okay, and next slide. And also, guys, have the owner signing the consent for that. Sometimes we get excited, we forget. And have the owner choosing if they want CPR or not. So important. Uh, next slide. Um, also think about after the surgery, guys, you need to have a plan for pain medication, pain management, heat support. Um, and that's another thing that we're going to talk here. You don't, we are trying to avoid the patient from crashing, right? So we're going to talk about avoiding hypotension. So things that we can do so our rabbit's blood pressure does not decrease, things that we can do so our patient does not hypoventilate, right? So we want to keep um, the oxygenation above 95 um, that's CO2. We want to keep the entitled CO2 between 35 and 45, which is exactly the same for dogs and cats. Dr. Chin, if I say something that is not correct for dogs and cats, you have a job to tell me here. <laughs> uh, also, we want to make sure they don't go hypothermic. We don't want their temperature to drop from 100. So their normal temperature is from 100 to 104 Fahrenheit. Okay. If they are 99, that's okay. But we don't want to wait until they are 96 to start um to start heat support so you don't want them to get to that point it's all about not getting to the scratch points it's not about fixing see what i'm saying this is the whole thing this is how we stop losing rabbits you intubate and you watch trends and you crise which is the main thing of this this um main thing of this lecture so preventing crashing, right? So preventing, not acting on it, right? So watching your trends, intubating, and then using less gas anesthesia, which is the focus of our topic today. Do you use anticholinergic uh, asking? Do you use anticholinergic? Excellent question. Absolutely not. Okay. Not even for dogs and cats, guys. We don't give anticholinergics unless we need it. And what do I say by need? Okay. So usually I can is probably asking that because old school medicine is, Hey, I'm going to give an anticholinergic. So a glycopyrrolate in the case of rabbit or an atropine in case of dogs and cats. So the heart rate is high. So I don't have to deal with that with the low heart rate, right? During with bradycardia during surgery. That's not okay. OK, first of all, because we only use it if we need. What do I mean by if we need? Hey, if the if the heart rate is low, re, low, I mean, abnormally low during anesthesia, the first thing you're going to do is, is my patient too deep? 
If it is too deep, you're going to use less anesthetic. So if you're doing a gas, you're going to lower your gas. If you're using a CRI, you're going to lower the infusion. Okay. Um, you might want to reverse something. If it's really dangerously low and you already lowered everything and it continues to be dangerously low, you might want to reverse. Say you use an alpha two, you might want to reverse that. So you need to do all those things first, which by the way, are 99.9% .9 of the time, the, the guilty here. Okay. The, the one to blame. So the other thing that we know for a fact in rabbits is that anticholinergics will cause GI syndrome afterwards. So you go like, okay, I don't need to deal with a bradycardia during surgery. However, I need to deal with GI syndrome after surgery. So then as the person anesthetizing just washes their hands like, hey, didn't die under anesthesia, so I don't care what happens after. No, teamwork, people, okay? Um, so again, remember the room, we're not going to have an Iceland there. Uh, so the air conditioner should not be cold unless you in a place that's really, really hot. You don't want to cook the rabbit. Uh, warm fluids. Remember that fluid requirement during surgery is usually five to 10 mix uh, MELs per kilo per hour. You know what? This slide is wrong. Kami, write down um, later. See, it says 10 mix per kilo per hour. It's supposed to read 10 MELs per kilo per hour. Okay. Next, next slide. Drink some water, guys. And be kind. See, be kind. We need to be kind to one another. Uh, also, intubation is paramount. Uh, ventilation materials have everything. We can go to the next one. And monitoring equipment. Okay, monitoring equipment um, is similar to dogs and cats. You can go to the next one, Kami. Similar to the dogs and cats, we need to have those guys. There's no, there's no skipping that step. So look there. I have, an, an, um, I have first of all. The patient is intubated, so I'm going to have an entitled CO2. And I understand, guys, if you are, if you're not from the United States or a first one country, if you are from a developing country like here in Brazil, which where I did all my, you know, vet medicine um, college school, um, I know those things can be expensive. Okay. I know that. I know for a fact. So, um, in Brazil, there are some ways, you know, you can buy them refurbished. You can buy them from human medicine. There are some other ways that you can do it. I understand sometimes it's not possible. So at the bare minimum, you can intubate them. Um, even if you cannot monitor the title and you can breathe for them during surgery. Um, and again, trying to prevent, but assuming that you have an entitled CO2, you must, you is a game changer, even for dogs and cats, guys. It's a game changer. And if you're not doing that, if you're not intubating and measuring the entire CO2, or if you are intubating and not measuring the entire CO2, only by doing that, your success rate is going to already improve like 80, 80, 90%. I, I, trust me, trust me, even for dogs and cats, guys. For birds, is an absolutely must. Okay. So you see here, I have an SPO2 there probe. There are many different types of SPO2 probes. So you have it there. So we are measuring the SPO2. We don't want it to be, well, we don't want it to be below 90%, but hopefully is a hundred percent or closer to a hundred percent. So the red line will be 90% or lower is when they start crashing, right? We don't want that. Um, you see the blood pressure cuff right there and we use it the same way. Okay. The same way you measure for dogs and cats, there's absolutely no difference. And the, and we also is the same parameter. We don't want the mean, um, blood pressure to be below 60 millimeters of mercury. Um, the same thing for dogs and cats. Again, we're not going to wait until we get to that point. Okay. Uh, I also have the ECG connected on the rabbit on the picture on the left. ECG running, okay. The stethoscope is the stethoscope is always on. If you cannot, I have a rule. If you cannot hear a beep beep, your stethoscope needs to be on the chest of the animal. And if you see a change on the monitors on the monitor device, doesn't matter which change it is, you first check the patient. One very very typical mistake, guys. I can guarantee you've done that. I've done that. Is everything's perfect and you start seeing some changes, you go like, oh, it must be the monitor. No, guys, it, no, it does not must be the monitor, okay? It's probably the patient. Go check, verify. For instance, you're like having a great ECG and suddenly you don't have an ECG. Don't fuss around with equipment. Put the stethoscope on the chest and make sure you have a heartbeat. If you have a heartbeat and you check the number, right, 
then you go fast with the equipment, okay? The same thing with the entire CO2. I can do you monitor arterial blood pressure if so where? No, I don't do that current. I don't do that routinely. I will do that if I'm doing a research or something. Um, just like in dogs and cats, we don't routinely do that. So uh, we can use oscillometric. You can use the sphincter manometer. So you're doing indirect blood pressure just like you do in dogs and cats. Great question. Coming next slide. Mm. Here are some options. Here's some options for monitoring devices, but again, whatever you have is great. Kent Carpenter, how do you measure tube depth when intubating? Same way you do for dogs and cats. So you measure from the commissure here um, to the, the base of the neck. Um, that will give you uh, the measurement, right? Because you don't want to intubate um, one lung versus the other, right? Great questions, guys. Keep it coming. Great questions. Those are some um, options here for you guys. They're portable uh, monitors. But again, the goal is to, to monitor blood pressure, entitled CO2, SPO2, temperature, ECG, um, and your stethoscope, of course, is not here, but it should be there too. Uh, and it doesn't matter. The one on the left is called the PET map, um, and the one on the right is called the VET quarter. Um, they don't necessarily have everything. You need to buy different um, options that have everything or the monitor that you have for dogs and cats should also be okay. Okay, next slide. Again, guys, we you probably already have everything you need to be able to do this. Uh, here, I just have some, um, some physiological values for you guys. I already kind of told you all of the, those. So those are uh, parameters you want to keep during anesthesia. Uh, we can go to the next one. And again, always monitoring, always monitoring. Another very good tip is pre-oxygenation. When I talk about intubation, again, if you haven't seen that webinar um, we have on our online courses, it's very, it's very, very important before we are about to intubate. Uh, we want to make sure we're not letting our patient be hypothermic or hyperthermic. Oh, and here, I don't remember, Akin did ask me about parasympatholytics. Uh, I, I had on my slide, so thank you to, about the anticholinergic and analgesia, guys. Next slide. Because, yes, anesthesia is not analgesic, okay? It's not and you're going to be amazed when you use good analgesia, how little of gas you need to use. It's astonishing. And he's just showing a rabbit being receiving oxygen. Okay. I don't want to see you ever again masking down patients. I don't mess down anything, anything. Well, you know, I should say maybe I will mess down my a mouse. Um, but even like a sugar glider, a hedgehog, a rat, I will intubate. Now, it's a process, okay? So be kind, right? Be kind. It's a process. So our process right now is to put it on the mindset to try. We can go to the next slide. To try not to mess them down anymore, okay? I actually have on social media and even our community is the uh, no mess down challenge is a process. You're not going to just wake up and stop messing down everything, but I want you to get out of the habit. And I want you to, every time you go masking something down, you go like, okay, what could I be doing here to not mess down these patients? What are the things that I'm missing? What are the things I need to learn? What are the things I need to try? Try. Okay. I was, for example, I was, I wasn't able to intubate my first rabbits, my first three rabbits. I tried, I wasn't able to intubate, but I didn't give up. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. It's a process. What do you think, uh, VGLs? Okay. We're not going to talk about them today, Karina. Um, and uh, tube death. We're not going to be talking about this today. This was on the, the lecture about, um, intubation. If we have time at the end, I'm happy to go back. But today um, we are going to be talking about um, how to use less inhalant. Uh, Dr. Taimur Salam, what pre-medications can we use? We're going to talk about it. Don't you worry, my friend. Don't you worry. Oh, you were talking from, are you talking from outside of the U.S.? I think you had answered before. Uh, okay. So clinical signs of pain, guys, same things in dogs and cats. We can go to the next slide. Just a few other things. There's bruxism, uh, which is grinding teeth in rabbits, can be um, 
And that's what this video is showing. Um, can be a sign of pain in rabbits, can be uh, also a sign of I'm happy or I'm mad. Uh, but that's one of the things, you know, the posture. We also have the, you can play the video coming. We also have um, other signs of pain that use the grimace scale, which are facial cues. Uh, so the position of the eye, the ears, the whiskers. Um, is the video not playing, Kami? You can go to the next slide. So we can keep moving. That's okay, Kami, we can go. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Next slide. There you go, next slide. I wanna go to the good stuff, next slide. Next slide, this is just showing about pain. Okay, so um, I would like to know how long after this type of anesthesia the rabbits are eating normally and how many pass after the procedure with type of, nobody passes, nobody dies. Um, we don't have GI syndrome after anesthesia if, you, if we do it properly. Uh, it's not a problem, it's not a concern. Uh, nobody dies um, and how after how long after the anesthesia eating normally i don't know two three hours um it depends or it, it, that's a very loaded question because it really depends on the procedure i did if i extracted five teeth that has nothing to do with anesthesia like they are probably not be eating not being super keen to eat two three hours later because you know i just took five teeth out of the mouth, just like a dog or a cat. So it has nothing to do with anesthesia necessarily. Um, or if it was a procedure that took, again, five hours, they're going to be groggy for many hours after surgery. So it really depends on what you did. That That's a, that's a very loaded question in a sense that I can't answer it with. Like, it's not a straightforward answer. Um, but nobody should die ever. And nobody, have, nobody, nobody should have GI syndrome. Uh, especially because one of the things I'm going to explain to you is, G, uh, is the CRI of lidocaine, okay? Okay, so airway and ventilation, uh, we always want to minimize that space. That's a big, big thing because the, the that space will cause the CO2 to rise. So you want to minimize that as much as you can. So again, your tube needs to be just as long as it needs. We just learned how to measure the tube uh, and how deep it goes. Again, I told you guys, is the base of the neck. Um, we want to make sure that we're using a non-rebreathing system, right? You're so welcome, Deanna. Uh, we want to make sure we're using a non-rebreathing system for patients that are less than five kilos, which is the majority of our rabbits, um, because a rebreathing system will generate a lot of dead space. And that, my friends, will cause this patient to crash, okay? So you, you can go to the next slide. Bain systems are also great. Bain systems are those systems that is a hose inside of a hose. So the inside hose has the gas and the oxygen and the outside hose has the um, expira expiratory air, like the air that comes from the patient. Next slide. So here in the picture on the left, we have the Bain system, see a hose inside of a hose. And on the right, we have a non-rebreathing system. Next slide. Now, guys, in title CO2 that we're going to use, that you have, um, those are just values, guys, for you to minimal um, gas flow if you're using a rebreathing versus a non-rebreathing system. Next slide. And it, again, it's the exactly same rule for dogs and cats. Does not change, okay? We're going to also uh, pass this. We're not going to be focusing on endotracheal intubation, but I will show you this video because we have a whole lecture on this, okay? So come and see if this video will play. Uh, it's just showing how I'm intubating the rabbit using a rigid scope. Again, this is a whole new webinar, uh, and we have this in our courses, but it's very, very, very important. Um, now, the entitled CO2, guys, you can have a mainstream and a side stream. Um, um, uh, probe is not the, the name, I don't think. But... Um, the side stream is a little tiny tube that comes from the side uh, of the anesthesia tubes. Uh, that's the best type for that space because it really virtually has no dead space versus the mainstream, which is a, a, a little tube that you, um, whoop. okay. <laughs> uh, come if it's not passing, that's okay. Um, we just need to keep going again. The side stream is a little cord, right? The, the monitor for the CO2 that comes on the side. So it's a very tiny, it's very little that space, if any. And the mainstream, it's a little tube that you're going to add to that anesthesia 
um, components, right? And not another component. So it does add a little bit of that space. However, guys, it has to be used. If that's all you have, it's it's great. Okay. We also gonna monitor vital signs every five minutes. I say here five to ten, but I want you to do that every five minutes. Uh, Dr. Termor, I'm not from the U.S., so have limited access to anesthesia. Mainly we have ketamine, xylazine, azopromazine, and that's going to be a problem. I know. Um, I mean, again, um, I hear you. I do. I do. Um, but at least you should try to intubate. Um, you know, there. you definitely have access to lidocaine. Um, lidocaine is something we can use CRI to do. Um, you know, I am sure, hopefully you have access to an opioid. I see here, those are not very good analgesics. Um, you know, so again, lidocaine, it might be a solution for you, a lidocaine CRI, because it does promote pain. It's also a broken edit. Oh, promote pain. Sorry. It does, um, promote analgesia. So it fights pain. Um, it also works as a prokinetic. It also lowers the MAC and 40%. So you're going to use less ISO. Again, there are alternatives and also local blocks you can do with lidocaine. Um, all of those things that we can do to lower, but monitor and also intubating. Okay. There is blind intubation techniques that you should definitely use. Um, again, there are other alternatives. Um, okay. Next, we already talked about monitoring. Next slide. Next slide. We already talked about all of those. Just showing here a rabbit. So um, you see that um, the capnograph is definitely, that's the purple part right there is the capnograph. That's a mainstream capnograph. My, my rabbit's intubated and there's SPO2, ECG, next slide. Uh, temperature that the black cord in the mouth is a esophageal thermometer. Here you see the whole time one of the technicians has her hand with holding a stethoscope and um, she's listening to the heart. We have obviously an IV catheter on um, and the patient is has a blood pressure cuff. There is fully anesthetized, fully monitored. Next slide. Um, again, looking, um, um, this is, and again, guys, every time you see a picture of a patient of mine with a mask is oxygen. I guarantee you never ISO, never guess. Um, and there is like using this phenomenometer, which is a very basic way to measure blood pressure. If you don't have an oscillometric, like the machine one next. So there's really no excuse to not measure blood pressure. Now talking about some pre anesthetics, uh, Dr. Timur, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Um, that I, I hear there are some doses for you, et cetera. However, guys, I do want to say that um, um, it depends, obviously, it's not a cake recipe. It depends what you're doing. Is it painful or not? How long is the patient going to be sedated and anesthetized? What drugs are you associating? So I'm going to give you here um, an idea, for example, for a spay, okay, for a pre-anesthetic. And one thing that I do want to tell you is that pre-anesthesia is as important as anesthesia because here's the thing. If you just do a light pre-anesthetic or you don't do pre-anesthetic at all, which is a huge, huge, huge mistake on our part, then it means that you're going to need to use more and more gas. And that we're going to the, get into the core of this lecture. Our whole goal is to use less gas. So to use less gas, we're going to need to use more of something else, correct? One thing that we're going to need to use more of is the pre medication. So I usually go with heavy, heavy, uh, heavy, uh, sorry, heavy pre-medication. Um, that means my patient is going to be like out and that will allow me to place an avicator to intubate correctly, but it's also going to allow me to use less gas anesthesia because my patient is already so, so deep into the sedation. And on the sedation here, an example, okay? Um, for a spay, as I was telling you, is a long surgery, is a, a painful surgery, right? So a ovary hysterectomy, so remove the ovary and the, the uterus in the female rabbit. Um, I will do, for example, apparently healthy, okay, so that is healthy. Guys, I, I always am so careful. Big disclaimer. Please, 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 this is not cake recipe. You're not going to get these and just go do this in all the rabbits. That's not the way it works, okay? It really depends on what we're doing. I change my protocols almost every time. 
or I change the doses that I'm using. Okay, if it's an old rabbit, young rabbit, painful surgery, not painful surgery, a 20 minute surgery or a five hour surgery, it really depends. But all, uh, often or almost every time, if I'm doing surgery, obviously I want analgesia. So I will use some type of opioid, okay? Uh, no, do not use paracetamol in rabbits, <laughs> Francisco. Um, so an opioid, I will be using it if it is um, really painful. We're talking about mu receptor opioids. We're talking about hydromorphone, oxymorphone. Okay, uh, morphine we should avoid because of GI syndrome. Um, again, um, if we are talking about a less painful procedure, we might be talking about buprenorphine. Um, instead, again, buprenorphine is not as great. Um, if I'm doing something really not painful, which I can't imagine a surgery that is not really painful, uh, I might be using butorphanol. I usually reserve butorphanol if I'm doing like a sedated x-ray and it's not painful. Um, so again, you want to use that good, very good opioid. Then I love to use a benzodiazepine. I'm always associating um, midazolam to my protocols because will give me the relaxation, will give me a uh, deeper uh, sedation. So I'm always using that. And then uh, if I can, if my rabbit is not with perfusion problems or cardiovascular problems, I will use an alpha-2, a dexmedetomidine or medetomidine if you don't have that. I will always associate something. So for an apparently healthy rabbit, for a spay young rabbit, for example, I might be using something like two mg per kg of midazolam. Um, 0 0.2 mix per kg of hydromorphone, and I might be using something like 0 0.01 mix per kg of dexmedetomidine, okay? So those are things that I might be using as a pre-anesthetic, and again, monitor, monitor, monitor. Another thing too, Dr. Tamur, um, if you, with the medications you have, for example, ketamine is something you can definitely do a CRI, okay? There is some analgesia with ketamine, not enough for a big surgery, uh, but that's another thing you can do. We're not talking about today about the intubation, uh, size bag and things like that. This is something I talk about on my anesthesia and in my intubation course. Again, if we have time, which I don't think we will, I'm happy to answer questions about that. But that's a different um, that's a different lecture or or not or and even better than webinar it's taking our course. So become a VetaHead member, essential member, and you have access. I have all this information in the rabbit course there. Next slide. That's a rabbit really heavily sedated. Okay, guys, that's what we want to see. Next slide. It will facilitate everything, even like clipping the hair. And then to in, for induction, again, there are many protocols we can use. Um, my preferred method is Propofol IV to effect. And remember, because we are so heavily sedated, we're going to use very little induction, but we do need to have a good induction to be able to intubate. And I talk all about this in our intubation uh, lecture on our courses. Alfaxolone, I would avoid to give that. I know propofol can also cause... Um, apnea and needs to be given slow, but I think alfaxalone even more. Ketamine in high doses can also cause apnea. I mean, pretty much everything that you're doing induction could cause apnea, so it needs to be given slow, but I think propofol is my favorite um, because I can titrate. Uh, next slide. I usually will also, if the volume of propofol is really low that I'm calculating for that patient, say I'm doing five mg per kg, I might not use all those five mg per kg, um, next slide, Kami. And I will say the five mix per kick for that patient is going to be something like 0 0.3 mLs, right? It's very little. How am I going to give that very slow? So what I might do is I get those 0 0.3 mLs and I dilute in saline, you know, to be at one mL instead of just 0 0.3. And that way I can give it slower. Um, now here we have some um, induction uh uh, dosages and uh, drugs for you guys here. We already discussed them. Another thing, guys, you see here that I don't have induction with gas because we're not going to be doing that, okay? We're not going to be masking them down. Because the whole thing is not to do so. Now, for maintenance, as you can see here, we want to keep our ISO below 2%. Actually, I want you to keep the ISO between 
0.5 to 1.5 max, okay? If you're keeping your, your isoflurane 3 and 4%, that rabbit will probably crash, okay? Um, and that means that you're not using other things such as pre-medication, next slide, such as uh, local blocks, such as CRIs, okay? Analgesia, very, very important. Um, again, I, we already kind of talked about this. This is just some doses for you. We talked about hydromorphone. We talked about um, some buprenorphine. We talked about butorphanol. We talked about some options. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Nancy Sweden, um, I use a combo of anesthetics that typically allows for intubation just on the one pre-medication injection. Is that okay? Should we be doing something different? So listen, I don't... Uh, oh, if you're using it, it's not pre -medication. Sorry, I thought you were talking about pre-medication. Yeah, guys, this slide is just to show you, again, um, the, the analgesic we, we talked about. If it's a combo of anesthetics that is allowing for intubation, great. And if you're monitoring uh, on one pre-medication injection, I see. No, I wouldn't do that because I don't want to, because the pre-medication is going to allow me to place an IV catheter, is going to allow me to shave the patient, is going to allow me to place all monitoring devices before I induce. So I wouldn't keep my patient induced for that long, right? The time for me to place an IV catheter, the time for me to place monitoring devices, the time for me to intubate. I would not keep my patient induced all that long. I think that's very dangerous. So I will use something for pre-anesthesia. So no anesthesia, pre-medication. He's not, the patient's not fully anesthetized. I will do all of these things, including placing all my monitoring device to then induce. Okay. I think that could be very, very risky. Now guys, meloxicam is very safe in rabbits. This is not for the surgery itself. This is post-op analgesia when we use the NSAIDs. Um, the one thing, tramadol guys, I want to just tell you, uh, tramadol, the doses we have, that's super helpful. Thank you. Of course, you're so welcome. Uh, tramadol, the only study we have in rabbits is a pharmacokinetic study, means they give the medication and see if they have uh, it reaches therapeutic levels in the blood. And the dose that they tested, which was 11 mg per kick, did not reach, and that was orally. So I don't use tramadol. I don't know what dose I need to use, so I don't use it. Okay, next slide. And then, as I said, morphine um, can cause GI stasis, so I try not to use it at all. I would use something like hydro, like oxymorphone, like buprenorphine, that can also cause some level of GI syndrome, but less. Okay, next slide. Now, woohoo, to the parts we talk about, the CRIs. Oh, my God, guys. I love CRIs as much as I love intubation. Seriously. Let's, let's let that sink in. I'm going to drink some water. Wait. Mm -hmm. uh, we do nasal. What is SX? Help the foreign here. Nasal SX on healthy adults. We always intubate, but... 7% die with five minutes of ketamine xylazine induction. Need safe pre-med so we can continue intubation. Yeah, I agree. I don't know what nasal SX is. So I guess I need to know that to answer your question. Um, okay, guys, constant rate infusions. What that is, is what the title says, right? Oh, surgery. We do nasal surgery on healthy adults. Um. Okay, I think, Sarah, we're going to need a little bit more info to answer your question. Like, I need to know what type of surgery, how are you intubated, are they dying before or after? Um, oh, they die within five minutes of ketamine. That, I don't think that has to do with your surgery. I think it has to do with your anesthesia protocol. What about metadone instead of morphine? Yes, you can use metadone. I don't, yeah, hydro, I told you, I, I, that's hydro is what I use. Um, and I gave you the doses. Uh, metadone, I don't have experience with metadone, but there are a lot of studies with metadone. So um, so I, I believe if you look at the studies, you're going to find really good info there. Okay, guys, constant rate infusion. So that means that you're going to constantly be infusing a drug, right? For example, isoflurane, you're constantly administering. Like it's not an infusion because it's not intravascular, but you're constantly administering that. So the idea here with the constant rate infusions are they are going to provide probably analgesia or anesthesia 
intravascularly, which will allow you to use less gas, okay? And each drug, each constant rate infusion, each drug will allow you to use um, less inhalant anesthesia, less gas in different percentages. And we're gonna see that. So th what that means is, depending on the drug, you're gonna be able to use even lower levels. For instance, fentanyl, you can use 60% less ISO when you use a CRI of fentanyl. When you use a CRI of lidocaine, you can use 40% less ISO. So it really depends on what drug you're using, okay? But all of them are great. I'm gonna talk about just the most common ones, but there are many, many options, okay? We can also do a, 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 a CRI of propofol. Again, not analgesic. You can do a CRI of propofol with ketamine, with, fent with um, lidocaine. You can do a CRI of hydromorphone with lidocaine. Okay, You can combine CRIs as well. Again, guys, the more we combine things, the less dose we use of everything and the safer is the anesthesia. Okay, so that is the goal. If you're using one drug, two drugs, wrong. <laughs> it's not that it's wrong, it's less safe, right? Um, again, and don't forget the local blocks, guys. Don't forget local blo blocks. Uh, so also, on top of using less gas, those constant rain infusions are going to allow us to prevent decreasing blood pressure. So fight the hypotension. It's going to allow us to cause less hypoventilation, more analgesia, smooth sailing anesthesia, next slide. So again, not only want to reduce the MAC of gas, of isoforin, so the MAC is, let, the MAC is how much, what percentage of ISO you need to have for anesthesia, right? So you want to reduce that level. Again, um, we want to decrease, I can also fight the decrease in blood pressure like lidocaine will do. Lidocaine is also great. Next slide, because the lidocaine constant rate infusion CRI, not only is going to provide analgesia and reduce the MAC in 40%, is also going to be, work as a prokinetic, so increases the GI motility, which is great. We want that, right? I use CRI of lidocaine on my awake patients that have GI syndrome or GI stasis. Here are some options, okay? So fentanyl now, guys, very, very important, okay? First of all, we should not be anesthetizing anyone without intubating. That is not even a possibility. But especially if you're using fentanyl CRI, your patient needs to be intubated because it will cause apnea, okay? So usually CRIs, they will have a loading dose. So it's a dose you give at once, usually over five minutes, IV, intravascular, and then you have a maintenance dose. For example, fentanyl. You have a loading dose of 10 micrograms per kilo, which you give slow IV, and then you follow with the constant rain infusion, which is 1 to 1.2 micrograms per kilo per minute, okay? Then you can keep the patient on that CRI after the surgery, so you're going to see that the dose is 10 times lower, okay, 0.1 to 0.2 micrograms per kilo per minute, because now... <coughs> your patient is going to be awake. Then we have the ketamine um, that we use, the ketamine CRIs that we use during anesthesia. Here's the dose for you. So Dr. Tamora, if you, you have ketamine there, that's something you can definitely be doing. Now, guys, if your patient has renal problems, you def might probably not want to use that or liver problems. Okay, again, it depends. That's why it's so important to have blood work. Um, we can also use the ketamine post-op for pain control. Now, I love my lidocaine. I love my lidocaine. So the lidocaine I use during anesthesia, I use after anesthesia, I use for awake patients that have GI syndrome, loading those two mix per kg IV over five minutes. Then the CRI is from 50 to 100, 50 to 100 micrograms. Guys, micrograms, not milligrams. Those CRIs are usually micrograms, okay? Micrograms per kilo per minute. So you have a range that you can go in the majority of them. <clears throat> okay, next slide. I love that, guys. If you want to start with one, start. oh, go back just for a second, Connie. If you want to start with one, start with the lidocaine. Now, when you, when you overdose lidocaine, one thing that you're going to see right away, right away might be uh, muscle spasms. So uh, be aware because, again, you're going to need to dilute those medications. And so you want to be very aware of toxic 
clinical signs as well, so you can pick it up. You always want to have people double. Um, I always have two, at least two people um, checking the doses, the calculations, making sure, because CRIs can get a little bit tricky for some people to calculate. There are also um, four... Um, I, I'm losing the words yet. They're also online. If you look, there are also some calculators for, for CRIs that you can just input the weight of the patient, etc. Now, I want you to be very careful with those online calculators because you need to see the uh, concentration of the lidocaine that they are using, okay? And the dose, obviously, because um, they will often dilute, have the, the lidocaine diluted, right? Because the lidocaine, at least in the U.S., is 2%, so it's 20 mg per ml. So you're going to need to dilute in fluid to be able to administer as a constant rate infusion. So you need, sometimes you will make a concentration that is 10 mg per ml, 5 mg per ml. So you need to make sure what concentration the calculators are using, the calculators online, so you can match your dilutions, Okay. But in our emergency course, for example, we teach you how to dilute drugs. We teach you how to do calculate constant rate infusions. We teach you all of that, okay? Also, guys, I will say, start with your lidocaine. I would say that's the safest one, uh, the most comfortable, not necessarily safe. It is, it is safe, too, obviously, if, if given the correct dose. But it's the most comfortable one. It's also the cheapest one, and everybody has lidocaine, right? And usually lidocaine is not even controlled. So it's even very easy for you to acquire because ketamine is controlled drug in uh, many countries. So I would start with the lidocaine. Again, the loading dose, two mg per kg, intravenous is low, and then you use 50 to 100 micrograms per kilo per minute. That's also the dose you're going to use as a prokinetic, okay? And so say you are so say you are using that pre-anesthetic protocol I told you, like medazolam, hydromorphone, dexmedetomidine, you induce with propofol to effect, mm -hmm. you intubate, then you keep the patient on the lidocaine CRI. We're talking about probably using 0.5 mix, oh, 0.5% ISO if you're doing a spade. 0.5%. Isn't that great? Sometimes, guys, depending if I did a local block too the ISO might even be off and you are only running oxygen. Isn't that so great? Which meds would be really good for post-op med and that we can use for more than five days? It depends what, what surgery, Dr. Tamur. Um, it depends what surgery you're doing, okay? If you want um, an opioid, you're going to probably need to use buprenorphine, sustained release. At least that's what we have available in the United States because the buccal will not... And that's, again, a, a different... It's a different lecture, and we also have all this information. It seems like you will benefit a lot because a lot of the very good questions you asked, we answer all of them in our online course. So if you are a VetaHead Essentials mem member, we have all of this information there for you. Uh, but meloxicam can be also uh, a good option. It really depends what you're trying to, to treat. Then, guys, after you do the lidocaine, I will say a, a very next good one is hydromorphone. If you have access, I understand that in some countries you don't have access to hydromorphone, but that's a great uh, CRI as well. Um, then the fentanyl, if you have access to fentanyl. For a long time, we didn't with the pandemic here. that was back ordered, but that's a very good one. Uh, again, you just need to be very, very, very good with intubation. Um, ketamine is another one that usually we see in every country. Um, so again, and you can combine them, guys. And the idea here is to be using so little ISO that your patient is not going to become hypotensive, right? It's not going to become, it's not going to hypoventilate because you are monitoring the entire CO2. And if they do hypoventilate, you are going to breathe for them, which is probably going to happen, the hypoventilation. But the pressure, guys, your blood pressure is a game changer. I'm telling you. So isofluorine, gas anesthesia will cause hypotension. It's not if, will. That's any animal, even humans, okay? So I know the blood pressure is going to drop. So then I don't monitor the blood pressure and I don't do anything to stop that. I know it's going to happen, okay? So when you do a CRI, it will, um, it will 
fight that effect, the side effect. Now, the other thing is if you're using an ISO, guys, you go, there's no magic, okay? You don't do pr good premedication. You don't do CRIs, okay? And you're having to run your ISO at 4%, 3%. Your patient will have low blood pressure. And then you're going to be like, oh, but I, I gave a fluid bolus and it didn't work. I gave um, an anticholinergic, it didn't work. I gave, you know, even like dopamine, didn't, of course it's not going to work because you continue to give the ISO. <laughs> If you don't lower the ISO, it's nothing's going to work. So you need to lower the ISO. Oh, but if I lower the ISO, the patient's going to wake up. That's why you need CRIs. That's why you need premedication. Okay. That's why you need local blocks. Guys, I hope you have uh, learned. Uh, we can go to the next slide. I hope you have learned today how to be less reliant on gas anesthesia. I hope you start uh, dabbling on that. You start... Um, also, um, you know, being more curious and start understanding the things that you need to learn next to provide safer anesthesia. Again, guys, webinars are great to give us insights of what we can do, what we should be doing, but nothing is going to replace you for taking a whole course, right? And that's why we have it on, on our um online platform, our essentials membership, because I can't, the course, so you know, is nine and a half hours. So it will take me nine and a half hours to go through everything with you, teaching you how to um, place IV catas, intubate, all of those things, like uh, the pain medications, everything that you guys are asking, like dentals, the space, the spay technique itself, all of that we have in there. Uh, Nancy, you're so welcome. Karina, you're so welcome. Karen, thank you very much for offering this. I missed the first half, but the second half was also good. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. Is there some time for questions? Maybe one question, guys. Thank you. It was awesome. You're so welcome, Elita. Dr. Timur, thank you. I will subscribe to the program. Thank you for excellent questions, Dr. Timur. I really love when you guys ask all these questions. I know I can answer them all. Uh, guys, I want you to do me a favor. Can you do me a favor in exchange? Go to the, um, the post about this webinar. I'm going to open here to show you what post it is. Go to that post, please. Show me so love. First of all, subscribe to our um to our Instagram is the on the line vet ahead. Subscribe to it if you're not um, already there. And then I want you to go to this post here. See, talking about the webinar, go there and comment what you learned here. Show me some love, guys. Subscribe to our Instagram. Send to your friends so they know we post a lot of free content here. And then Send me love here. Go here and tell me what you learned today. I love it. Um, let me see here. There are some acupuncture points in turtles for shortening the recovery period. Is there a similar thing? I'm sure there is. I can, I'm sure. I'm a big fan of acupuncture myself. I have done in me, but I don't understand about it. So, But I'm sure there is. I'm sure. Uh, Karen, going to do a month subscription now. Oh, my God, Karen. Take, oh, yeah. Guys, thank you, Karen, for saying that. We... For the essentials membership, you can pay once a year or you can pay monthly, okay? So both. Um, let me see what else here. Um, Fuzzy Bunny, thank you so much for this, Doc. Oh, of course. Fuzzy Bunny is always with us. Thank you. I always see your comments. I see your DMs. I love it. Thank you so much. Guys, I love this interaction with you. I love this interaction with you guys. One day I should do a whole webinar just to interact with you guys. <laughs> Would you like that? Like um, a question and answer webinar? Like no topic? You know what I mean? Like we just have a one hour uh, about medicine, obviously, <laughs> Zoom medicine. So one hour of question and answers. Would that be something you want to do? Um, then you can ask me anything. Hana Mitsuki, thank you so much, Doc. You're so welcome. Michelle Chen, thank you. As usual, so informative. Oh, my God, that woman is so intelligent. Oh, my God. Macarena, good idea. You know, it might be, you know, all of those questions sometimes you have. Uh, Dr. Nancy, yes, that would be awesome. Uh, awesome, guys. Okay, don't forget to go there. Send us some love on Instagram because that's the way I know if you're liking what we're doing or not uh, and what we should be doing. Hannah says, yes. <laughs> uh, um, subscribe to our channel. Uh, the Educated Rabbit, thank you. Very informative. You're so welcome. Sarah says, love Q&A. Um, 
Thank you. Very informative. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, it, we passed 15 minutes from uh, what we wanted to. However, this was so awesome. You guys asked, asked really good questions. Seriously, really good questions. Um, and I love this. And we are trying to do these webinars kind of, kind of often, or once a month or so. Sometimes we can't. But if you also have some topic that you want to uh, me to talk to, then just comment on that post as well, and I'll be happy to attend that. Uh, yes, Q&A, if hopefully at this time also. <laughs> it depends where I am in the world, Fuzzy Bunny, because uh, now I'm in Brazil, for example, um, but when I'm in the back in the States um, on Pacific time, it gets tricky. But anyway, thank you, guys. I will leave you here. Thank you, Kami. Kami is behind everything, guys. Camila, she's behind all our social media, all our webinars. She makes this happen. Thank you so much, Kami. Thank you, guys. Have a lovely day, lovely rest of your week, and I will see you soon. Bye-bye. And today we're going to be talking to you about everything histocomorphs, everything with our guinea pigs and our chinchillas. From getting comfortable with the basics to doing anesthesia and basic surgical procedures. Intubation, mm -hmm. dental procedures, space, neuters, urinary diseases, respiratory diseases the sneaky unrecognized killers like cardiovascular disease. For sure, ER, we're gonna talk about CPR. We're also gonna talk about imaging and blood work interpretation, as well as husbandry techniques, because that's always important in our small mammal species. If you are a veterinary professional, either a veterinarian or a technician or a student, this course is certainly for you. For more information, visit vetahead.vet. Hello, my friends, Dr. Prensa here. Begin. are um, a bit more fragrant than some of our other species so kind of did you say open. fragrant i did say fragrant <laughs> they tend to urinate Stink. and, and <laughs> defecate a bit more yes and so with that oh, that's why i'm gonna call my kids now they're fragrant <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Lila Proenza. And I'm Dr. Miranda Siddhar. And, and this, this is how we think, think ahead. And today we're going to be talking to you about everything histocomorphs, everything with our pigs and our chinchillas. 
from getting comfortable with the basics to doing anesthesia and basic surgical procedures. Intubation, mm -hmm. dental procedures, spays, neuters. Urinary diseases, respiratory diseases the sneaky unrecognized killers like cardiovascular disease. For sure, ER, we're gonna talk about CPR. We also gonna talk about imaging and blood work interpretation, as well as husbandry techniques, because it's always important in our small mammal species. If you are a veterinary professional, either a veterinarian or a technician or a student, this course is certainly for you. For more information, visit vetahead.vet.